Hi, Berengai, can you hear us? Perfect. Hello. Hello. Justin, can you can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. So Virenga Inabika is the senior policy advisor for ISOCA, which is the Internet Society. Uh, we have James Gondwe, which is the executive director of uh, CYD Malawi, the Center for Youth Development in the Community Network uh, here in Malawi. Uh, and then we have Justin Mugiza. Uh, she needs my introduction. Uh, she's the Africa Policy Coordinator at Internet for the APC Internet Initiative. And then we have uh, Joseph. Is she, I believe Joseph is a writer. Uh, uh, so Joseph is the, is the implementer of the Lambina Community Network, which is in Zimbabwe. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give it to the panelists to maybe tell us what they're doing now um, in their organizations and in regards to the community network ecosystem. So I'll start with you, Berengai. Uh, th thanks, Josephine. I hope you guys can hear me clearly. Uh, please confirm. Yes, oh, great. I can see. 
I can see James uh, nodding there. I, it's it's very sad that I couldn't be <laughs> I couldn't be there in person. I really wanted to to be uh, to be present there uh, with you guys, but unfortunately uh, at the moment uh, we the the ISO traveling policy hasn't changed yet. So I, I will have to uh, join you guys uh, remotely. But uh, all the same, I think uh, it's 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 a pleasure to be um, connecting with the colleagues from the community once again and um, it's 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 a pleasure also to 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 have this discussion i think uh, it's it's a discussion that is very close to our hearts and i'm, I'm happy to see familiar faces there so um, once again my name is verenga mabika i, I think uh, josephine you you said it well that i'm senior police advisor of africa with the internet society um, just uh, briefly, Internet Society is a, is a global not-for-profit organization uh, that is working to empower people to, to keep the internet as a force for good. And we work to keep the internet open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy. And uh, over the years, we, we have been a very big supporter of our community networks. Um, and um, we, we have all also supported quite a, a number of community networks uh, in, in the region in Africa. And uh, this is uh, primarily because our continent, our region, yes, um, the majority of uh, our communities or our people not, not yet connected. <clears throat> I think um, as of uh, this year, probably we have just connected just above 40%, if I'm not mistaken. So, so you can see there's, there's still a huge gap and what we are doing at Internet Society is to uh, um, promote or advocate for complementary access solutions. So we, we know that there's a, there's a primary, there's a conventional way of connecting the unconnected, but we, we are also thinking that the community could potentially close the gap um, the, that is currently there. And um, we are working with communities in different countries to, to make sure that we that gap. Uh, um, it's not just in Africa alone. We we are working to grow the internet to reach people in um, in in all the different regions of the world. In fact, with regards to community networks, we have supported uh, 58 community networks to date in about 40 countries, and uh, this this uh, stretches from uh, um, North America, Latin America, Europe, uh, Africa, and Asia. So <clears throat> this is something that is very uh, a, a very strategic uh, objective for our organization. And maybe uh, let me just mention that um, recently, for those that uh, follow the policy meetings, there was uh, the EU International Telecommunications Union uh, conference in Akigali in Rwanda. And uh, it's called WTDC World uh, Telecommunications Development Conference. And uh, in this conference, we actually made a pledge that is very much uh, uh, supporting the complementary connectivity solutions. So between uh, this uh, next year and uh, 2025, we we made a pledge to support 100 community uh, 100 complementary connectivity. Uh, solutions, which means we, we are going to be supporting about 100 community networks across the world. And we also train about 10,000 um, uh, people to, to help and maintain and build the, the internet infrastructure across the, the world. So I also just wanted to, to, to mention this in case uh, some of you may be interested in checking out the pledge and seeing what, uh, seeing what we um, uh, thanks, uh, Josephine. Let me. Uh, back to you, Josephine. Hello? Hello? 
colleagues who are connected online, are you able to hear me or we have been disconnected or it's my connection? Joseph, can you con confirm? Yeah, I can hear you, Virenga. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, I see that the the ground team has just dropped, so I guess it's probably their connection. And um, while least we wait for the for them to reconnect with us, I, I noticed that uh, I shared a link for colleagues to connect. So please, um, you you can you can rename uh, the name that is appearing on the screen. Otherwise, <laughs> we have uh, uh, many Verengai Mabika. So what you do, you simply go on participants and then uh, you click rename and then you can re re put your name there. Uh, Josephine, I think you are back, right? Yeah, we can hear you now. I had introduced myself, Josephine, you can take over from me. Thank you very much. Hi, Steve. Yeah, so um, capacity building uh, policy uh, in regulation and property. And uh, uh, Josephine, it seems like your connection is breaking a bit. Not sure if it's just mine, but uh, other colleagues can confirm. Please uh, confirm if. Uh, you can hear the ground team clearly. Better? Yes, that's much better. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so I said uh, capacity building, uh, policy and regulation advocacy. Uh, we also support in tech and innovation because as the networks grow, uh, they need platforms to support the work that they do. So this can be building platforms, monitoring platforms uh, for them to be able to grow. So quite uh, looking forward to this session. Uh, to share about our work and also to get to know who is in the room and how we can be able to collaborate with them. Thank you very much, Justin. I'm moving over to you, James. Thank you so much, Catherine. Hello, everyone. So, my name is James Kondre, and I'm the director of the Center for Youth Development. We are a local and community organization here in Malawi, uh, based headquartered in Zuzu, but our operations are across the northern and the central part of Malawi. So, uh, specifically, what we do is to try to enhance the potential of young people and connect them, connect them to education, health, and livelihoods. So we have to maximize their potential uh, so that at the end of the day, they need to be what they're supposed to be. And the way we do our work is to leverage on ICT. And uh, normally, we provide schools with access to equipment, we provide training on ICT. And uh, we've also been looking at solutions on connectivity, recognizing that uh, you know connectivity is a bridge to all these facets of working on, so education, health, but also livelihoods. And uh, from 2018, we've been exploring the community networks model, and uh, through that, we came to learn of ISO, we came to learn of um, Association for Progressive Communications as being the players that are actually promoting community networks. And uh, in the process, we are part and parcel of uh, the project that Josephine described, which is the Lockman project. And in that particular project, um, we had an opportunity to undergo some capacity building and then also access to you know, technical support and some funding you know, to help us in setting up or traveling out the community network. So we started some initiatives in Zuzu uh, around the community network. And in addition to that, we also recognized some of the challenges that are to do with community networks. And most of these challenges are to do with policy. So we also have another project with the same support from ABC, that is the Association for Progressive Communications, but also the World Association for Christian Communications work. So these two you know, partners, WAC and ABC, are working with us together with the University, but also ITAM. I recognize Bram Kutzelan, who is the president of ITAM, 
uh, to try to work with MACRA, which is related in Malawi, but also with, with the Ministry of Information to, you know, to try to raise awareness about community networks as a model to address challenges, um, you know, the connectivity challenge. But apart from that, we are also looking at, um, you know, can we try to lobby and advocate for a better policy and regulatory framework uh, that can actually work for community networks? So that's something that is in progress that what you're doing with uh, Michael and the others in Malawi. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you very much, Jason. I don't know if Joseph has joined us. So Joseph, welcome. You can introduce yourself and the work you do in the Malawi Community Network. Um, thank you so much, uh, Catherine and colleagues. Uh, greetings from Zimbabwe. My name is Joseph Bishi. I'm the project lead for the Murambina Community Network. So uh, a brief breakdown about the Muramira community network is started uh, in early 2000 as, as a cyber cafe, offering internet service and digital literacy to uh, community residents. And uh, we further extended our relationship with the Ministry of Education, which allowed us to train educators, uh, that is the headmasters and the school teachers uh, for about 200 school. 200 Christian schools in, in Buera district, which is uh, the district where Murambina Community Network runs from. And uh, we begin to grow in our attempt to make a positive contribution within uh, our local community, addressing the national imbalance of a majority of over 60% of the populace who reside in rural areas uh, in bridging digital divide and also in an attempt of marrying the national and international development strategy uh, that uh, strives to see the digital gap being reduced. And uh, this resulted us to grow into a fully fledged commit network uh, in 2018 after getting the support from the Indian society. And uh, we, get, we got to uh, engage and collaborate with other organizations uh, from various countries uh, which are doing also community networks and uh, through the support also of our association progressive communication we collaborate with the Tunapanda Net of Kenya to deploy some local content platforms and the school management uh, management system platforms in an attempt to add, add value to our network. We also uh, deployed some e-commerce platforms uh, initially to start with local farmers, enabling them to uh, sell their produce online. And uh, we did this also with in collaboration with uh, uh, our one of the uh, biggest ISPs in Zimbabwe, which is still one, to fit into our community network. And uh, we have built a network which uh, covers a radius of about uh, 40 kilometers. Uh, connecting a number of schools, uh, connecting local farmers, connecting hospitals, and uh, the community at large. And uh, this got or this received uh, government recognition in 2021, last year, uh, in, in, in getting the project being launched as the first initiative, uh, which is a national model that strive for 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 replication across the country. And uh, in that same uh, manner, we managed to host a national community network conference, uh, which gathered uh, a lot of innovators across provinces of the country, uh, where we share our experience on our deployment. And this also resulted in uh, the policy being uh, changed towards development and assist uh, in supporting the, the community initiatives. Um, I think uh, that's what I can say for now and to we'll take it through uh, during our conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. I think everyone's uh, big enough to recognize our very able repertoire. Uh, and uh, Ruben Moyo, who is our online moderator, is the head of the Department of Business and Humanity. So welcome everybody. Um, so as Africa is seeing an emergence uh, in community networks, uh, we realize there isn't enough awareness on exactly what community networks are. Um, 
so I guess maybe you can tell us for the sake of those people who are maybe hearing about traditional classical apartheid or those who have heard about it but uh, are not really sure what it is. Uh, maybe you can maybe describe what it is or it's not. Yeah? Sure, yes. Uh, so community networks are bottom up citizen driven networks. Um, in Kenya, we have something called Harambe where we come together and pool resources for different reasons. We can be either we are fundraising for school fees, we can be fundraising for a funeral, that is quite common. Um, weddings, um, yeah, so just very many of the social events um, in life, as well as just supporting one another. And these are because that um, sometimes there are failures within our systems to be able to provide this support. So we see the same thing in the telecommunication sector, where um, whereas um, commercial operators are supposed to go and provide universal connectivity, there are areas that it's very difficult or not viable for them to be able to go and provide that access and connectivity. And so instead of communities uh, sitting and waiting until a solution is found, they come together, pool resources, um, and start this network. So what is a community network? I would say the models vary from country to country. Uh, we have cooperatives, we have NGOs, we have CBOs, but the core thing is around the aspect of community ownership, community-driven uh, values, um, so that there are some who want access to the internet, there are others who just want access to internet services. And um, so they come together, they will build the network, um, it's maintained by the community. Um, and then, yeah, so I think uh, governance models, mostly NGO, CBOs, and cooperatives, but at the core of it, I would say, is the aspect around um, community ownership. And it's similar because, um, so there will be two different types because they mostly serve last a connectivity. So at last night, we have small scale operators who serve, um, and they might be commercial, but we also have community networks now um, that are community owned. The movement is growing in Africa. Uh, currently, we have over 30 community networks in East Africa, in West Africa, West Africa uh, Southern Africa, as well as Northern Africa. So we are grateful in terms of even just the different stakeholders that are now coming on board. We've had uh, engagement with the African Union Commission. Um, currently at CPC, we are also engaging with the International Telecommunications Union uh, together with ISOC in just seeing how we are able to support this movement. And also at national level, uh, quite a lot of growth there. I think uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Kenya, Nigeria represented here by CTAC, and some South Africa as well are examples where we're seeing a lot of momentum. Well, thank you very much, Justine. And just to build on that, on the number of community networks and the connectivity of it across the continent, uh, we'd like to maybe move into the movement, how the movement has been growing up. And I'd like to produce to Verinda just to give us a picture of how the movement uh, has been growing up around the continent. And then we can move to Justine. You can tell us, um, according to the Kenyan context, uh, uh, James, you can pick it up uh, to give us the Malawi context. Uh, and Joseph, you can pick it up to give us the Zimbabwe context. Uh. Over to you, Brendai. Uh, thanks again, Josephine. And I hope, uh, colleagues, you can still hear me. Uh, it looks like there's a bit of uh, a connection lag, but um, and, and now I can hear you quite clearly. So. Um, um, Josephine, you asked me to briefly talk about uh, the growth of the CN movement in the African region and what we are seeing as some of the key drivers of this uh, of this growth. So, um, uh, first of all, um, I, I would say uh, the the growth of the CN movement um, in in the past few years. I I, I would say personally, I, I don't think that. Uh, the CN movement is growing as much as we would like it to be, simply because, um, again, reflecting back on uh, the, the statistics that I shared, that we, we still have a very huge gap to connect uh, Africans, and um, they, they really need for, for, for this movement to, because we are seeing that 
traditional models are not really interested to go to some places. But there has been quite a, a significant growth in the past few years, especially in the last two to three years. And um, most of it has been uh, because of, uh, yeah, I would say there are three things that has been sort of dictating this growth. Um, firstly, it is the thing to do with the, the, the regulation requirements and um, the regulatory guidance that we see in, in different countries. So um, in, in countries where, in, uh, sorry about that. In, in countries where there has been some movement in terms of uh, uh, regulation uh, that is supporting uh, CNs, uh, we, we, we are seeing a actual growth and um, some progressive uh, uh, um, interest from quite a number of communities. I can mention firstly Zimbabwe, of course, Joseph is going to talk about Zimbabwe in, in, in detail on, on the, the efforts that they've made, but we are seeing uh, even uh, the interest from the Zimbabwean government just this year, a few months ago, the regulator is already called for licensing of six new community networks in Zimbabwe. We are also seeing the same uh, where there has been some policy changes in, in Kenya. Again, my colleagues will talk about Kenya in more detail. Uh, we, 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 some of the uh, first CNs have been established in Uganda. And this is also because Uganda now has a very supportive policy framework. Um, and I think this is quite progressive. In the other countries where this is happening uh, is uh, South Africa, uh, where we just uh, last year, uh, there was another launch of a very big uh, community network, which is doing quite, um, quite well uh, in, um, in, in South Africa. And um, uh, the other countries that I would like to mention is Nigeria, DRC, we, we are seeing a government, governments in Namibia, for example, taking a very strong interest in, in exploring the CN movement. Um, Cameroon is another one where, where the government, again, is taking a very strong interest in, in supporting the growth of CNs. So I, I would say in, in general, uh, where there has been an attempt uh, to accommodate uh, community networks in policy frameworks, we are seeing that this encourages the communities, it encourages the NGOs or other that may want to venture into this space because the opportunities are, are multiple. The, 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 it doesn't just end at just connecting the people, but also comes with a lot of other, um, a lot of other opportunities like, uh, you know, connecting with education, the health sector and, um, all these applications that can ride on top of a um, on top of a community network. So the 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 most the other interesting part I think is also the recognition that is coming from the regional organisations such as the African Union Commission, which has made a declaration to support community networks. In fact, in their uh, digital transformation strategy. I think it's going to be discussed in one of the sessions. Uh, there's a very uh, strong interest again to support complementary solutions, especially addressing rural areas. And um, the digital transformation strategy is a, is a strategy that's stretching for 10 years from 2020 to 2030. So, so at those high levels, we, we think this is a very progressive approach that uh, our leaders are taking at the continental level. And we hope that uh, we can get more support from now the communities themselves to connect themselves and also from other uh, partners or players that can support with other uh, necessary tools like uh, the capacity building to train the engineers or to train the people who wants to do this. Uh, the regulators coming of course with the uh, uh, spectrum support and blessing licensing uh, frameworks that are supportive of this movement. Uh, let me pause there, Josephine, and, uh, and hear the other colleagues also talk about their national space. Back to you. Um, 
just to uh, build on what Brenda is saying, that um, there are factors that really support uh, growth at national level. I would say in Kenya, we had the first pilot in a community network in 2015, 2015 and that was uh, Tunapana Community Network. Uh, but since then, there's been a lot of awareness um, around uh, what community networks are, and now we have about seven, um, four that have already piloted, but other three are in the pipeline uh, with regards to piloting. So once you build awareness around the, the community, the next uh, important thing I think is um, a supportive or a, an enabling environment. Um, and whereas Kenya just adopted um, the community networks license last year, I would say that when it comes to small operators, um, the regulator is a bit uh, flexible. I don't know if it's a bit too important to say that. But um, so small uh, wireless ICs that are serving small communities, it's really an area that the regulator knows they exist, but it's not really that they come and shut it down. And I think because of that, it gives us a space to innovate and grow. And so since 2016 to last year, a lot of the community networks that were operating did not have a license that were not shut down by the regulator. Outbreak, but also now bringing into regulation helps in terms of managing issues such as uh, interference from other operators. Um, and then a core thing that has also helped has been support from, I would say, regional and global organizations, uh, APC Internet Society, who um, are sort of unfolding these community networks through the different cycles that they go into. When you want to pilot in the telecommunications sector, it's quite expensive. Equipment does not come cheap. So uh, organizations such as Internet Society, APC have been instrumental in providing that initial seed funding for community networks to be able to pilot. Um, and also capacity building. So currently in Kenya, we have a national school of community networks, which is coordinated by Tunapanda. And it brings together different players, grassroots, especially communities, who want to learn how to deploy a community network. So as Brenda said, there's a need for that capacity building. And what the school does is that they will take the different communities to learn about the aspects that involve technical work. So how do you set up a network? How do you do the initial mapping? But they also look at other issues around sustainability. You will not build a network, you will not be reliant every day on grant funding. So you need to figure out the business model and that is how now the school supports, but also engagement with regulators. What we found out, even myself, as I started working in the community network space, um, I championed the first community network in Kenya and I did not know anything about regulation. I knew I was operating in Wi-Fi. I didn't know if I needed licensing. Uh, so it's actually, I think 2017, 2018, it's when I knew, oh, but I'm actually operating an illegal network. So also that now capacity building to understand what is the regulation space like, especially at community level. At community level. We are not commercial operators, so we don't have um, the financial muscle to have a whole legal team to support you with that. And I think what I really appreciate with the regulator in Kenya, that is the Communications Authority, is that they are able to come down to the level of community and to understand the challenges that we face and engage us at that stage. Thank you very much, Justine. Uh, James, think that you are at your home ground. Uh, give us a context, the Malawi context. It's quite a challenge, uh, but I'll try. Yeah, so the Malawian context is, um, I think we had some initiatives as well as around green tech team. There was, uh, I think, Macra and um, Tassa College, uh, Professor Tumana Mikeka did pilot in the network uh, using the TV watch based technology. So they piloted it, but I don't think it's still functional. Uh, you know, probably a few years later, uh, it's not a way now. Um, so, there are reasons to it that probably we should be able to take into later on because it comes down to the foundation of the community network. Is it a bottom up or top down? So that's another angle that we have to look into. But then, apart from that aspect, um, ourselves as South African development, of course, with the support of uh, uh, APC, we did uh, conduct a stakeholder workshop in 2019 uh, that was held here at the ICC. 
and through that particular workshop, we were able to bring together a number of people, participants uh, that came together and talked about the media networks as a potential solution in you know, order to bridge the digital divide. And at that particular meeting, it was probably what sort of like the first level of awareness for people to get to know what is the community network, what is it about. And I remember Josephine came on there and I uh, was one of the you know speakers who had actually talked more about what community networks is. So from that we had seen a number of people that actually expressed interest uh, for what community networks are and then what it means that we've got a group of people here in Malawi, uh, both individuals, organizations, some from the private sector as well, who are actually interested to, you know, to try to take this model to the next level. So that is movement in terms of people, movement in terms of organizations and companies. But then apart from that, um, ourselves as an organization, we are piloting a wide area internet uh, in Zosu. So it's, it's not, we're not providing internet but it's a wide area network uh, where a few schools are connected to each other and then they're able to share education resources. Our idea is to be able to, you know, take that to the next level, you know, provide a gateway to the internet. So probably that is one that might actually develop into uh, a community network. Um, and then we are also looking into other communities. Uh, you know, when we are working across over 150 schools that have been provided with computers from ourselves. And almost all these schools, what they're asking is how best they can get connected. So it means that we've already got a demand from people, uh, from schools and communities that are saying we want to be connected. So that is also another potential. But it, overall, when I have to assess uh, the growth as a country, I think the movement is not as big. Uh, I think we still have a long way to go. And I think one way or the other, uh, policy and proper regulatory make me be a contributor. Because you know, we normally operate in an environment where we feel safe and where there is more regulation, people tend to you know not shine away. So that may actually contribute to that, but that's an option in terms of uh, the movement in Malawi. Thank you very much, James. Uh, I'd like to move to Joseph. And uh, Joseph is talking about the Zimbabwe context. Uh, maybe to begin if you can mention uh Portra's made a declaration to support community networks. Maybe talk about how that declaration has changed things, huh? or do you think it's going to change things in the community network space? Huh? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Catherine. Sorry, can I quiet? Yes, sure. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. Uh, so, <laughs> in terms of this bubble context. Uh, I think we've seen um, great giant steps towards development through the support of uh, the regulator and the government. Uh, the initial step uh, that we saw as a positive step was getting the project being launched as a national model for replication. Second step was uh, to have the change of policy uh, which accommodates community networks to be established, anyone to apply from anywhere uh, across the country and being licensed in an easier manner than before, uh, which was a great positive step. And uh, we saw again uh, through the Ministry of ICT, uh, us hosting the national, the inaugural national community network conference. Uh, we need to say this is something which is going to be ongoing nationally. And uh, the two guys that is in front of you, uh, James and Josephine, attended visually to the, to the National Community Network Conference, contributing and sharing their experience, and uh, which was greatly, which was a great progress. Uh, and I can tell you it was mainly funded by local ISPs, uh, the regulator, and so forth. Uh, and we saw early this year, like when I said, um, some CNs being licensed, five of them. And uh, we saw again the protest through the Universal Service Fund call, calling for applicants to apply who are interested in this. Because from the National Conference, trained about 44 
uh, people for, across the countries from all the provinces of, of the country uh, on how they can set up a community network. And um, what was coming in with the Universal Service Fund to say we can support you to build a community network uh, is something which is great progress and of great uh, interest that will see development uh, or the issue of bridging digital divide being addressed in a faster manner than before. Uh, uh, that's what I can say on the Zimbabwean context. Thank you. And uh, sorry, maybe, and again, you know, the, 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 the regulator, um, uh, the good thing is that it is welcome to any kind of spectrum innovations that we can suggest to them. And they are ready to listen and to review and come up with the best way. Is it spectrum sharing or any other forms that the spectrum is further availed to these community operators? Uh, that listening ear and that platform that they give us to suggest whatever we think is something that we really appreciate and it's a positive step that ensures that where we are going, it's very positive and it's exciting. Well, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, going back to what Verena was saying, that um, the movement is growing, but not at the rate that we would like to see it. Uh, maybe we can talk about how to eliminate uh, or reduce the barriers uh, to the emergence of community networks. And over to you, Verena, I would like for you probably to address the issue of accessibility and affordability to, uh, to backhaul capacity and also address the issue of uh, spectrum, uh, the different models of sharing spectrum and uh, government uh, commitment to increasing uh, spectrum frequencies. Uh, over to you, Brendan. Uh, thanks again, uh, Josephine. And um, yeah, I come, come to the... I'll try to, to, to hold it up. Hello, you, you, you can hear me? It's not just me, it's happening. Really? Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, somehow, when you are speaking from online, you sound, uh, you sound the same. So sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, um, well, uh, um, uh, let me go straight to the issues that you asked. Uh, um, so ca coming to some of the issues that we think could uh, propel the same movement to grow much faster is um, the, the aspect of, uh, so in addition to the regulatory frameworks that we talked about, I think the issue of uh, spectral management is very important. And um, I, I, I would share just a few examples of um, the types of um, some of the um, the aspects that some governments have taken with regards to spectrum. So in the, in the telecoms uh, industry, I think uh, you'd probably all of uh, you you'd agree with me that spectrum is one of the most valued uh, resource. Um, and um, of course, w w when you uh, put the, the aspect of community networks, the big players in the industry, they are very quick to say, so what's going, what's going to happen with regards to spectrum? Are these community networks going to be given free spectrum? Are we going to be sharing that spectrum with them? Um, are they, is there any um, management tools that we can use to make sure that the, the spectrum can be, can be used, especially in those uh, areas where, because most of these networks, actually, the big uh, telcos, they, 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 they apply for the spectrum and they just hold it. Sometimes it's, it's not used. So we have seen that um, uh, the countries that have been progressive with CNs, they've uh, taken uh, about three approaches. So the first is uh, actually to give community networks a license exempt spectrum. So especially for the uh, free spectrum, things like Wi-Fi, I think Joseph can also speak to that. We have seen countries making an effort to exempt CNs from uh, uh, spectrum licensing. Um, and secondly, we're also seeing that uh, progressive countries are also, you, you know, 
giving a shared license spectrum or a dynamic spectrum access in this case, where a, a community network, which is just operating in a particular small community would um, uh, work very closely with a big telco uh, where they would be able to use or to share the, that spectrum that has been allocated to, the, to, to, uh, to big players. And I think this is a very innovative way of uh, dealing with spectrum because firstly, you are making use of it. And then secondly, you are also getting value out of that spectrum. And then we are also seeing in, in, in countries like Namibia, for example, where uh, there is some kind of innovative licensing uh, uh, happening, especially in, the in, in trying to promote community networks. And in this case, community networks are mostly you know, led by community uh, uh, people who are actually based in those uh, local communities and sometimes not for profit organizations or NGOs. So it only makes sense to also you know, provide a social purpose kind of license, which could be, you know, be, 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 be given to exclu exclusively to, to, or granted to, to, to those community networks, especially the ones that are serving rural areas or, or underdeserved uh, areas. So I, I think this is, uh, this is uh, some interesting initiatives that we are seeing and that can be promoted in our discussions with government that there's a possibility to consider this. It doesn't cost the government. It actually makes use of the resources in, rather than just having all the spectrum lying idle and you know just uh, having the big telcos making noise about uh, uh, connectivity while they are not interested to make the investments. I think another important aspect that I would like to also mention is, is something that we are seeing coming out of Zimbabwe as well. I think Joseph briefly mentioned this, uh, that um, the, 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 the innovative financing um, is also very important and, and, and quite key. And uh, there are quite a number of uh, um, approaches that can support this. I think the primary one that would like to support and that we would like to advocate in future is, of course, the universal service funds. For many years, most of these funds have gone unused. Uh, sometimes countries collect so much money, but they are not able to uh, to make, I mean, to, to put these funds to effective use, especially bridging the, 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 the connectivity gap. So, so the idea of channeling the universal fund to support complementary connectivity solutions or community networks, I think is very is very strategic because it it gives the community networks or the organization that is at, at the lead in, in in this case maybe an NGO the leverage to be competitive, but also to be able to do to set up the basic things. Uh, so these startup costs are in most of the cases the most expensive ones. Once the community networks start operating, I think there is scope for it to be more sustainable if it, uh, you know, start using also um, cost benefit and also, uh, you know, break even uh, approaches. Uh, that, uh, that's more of um, the business approaches. Um, we we are also noticing that there is a great interest coming from also uh, international donors, and I think. Uh, this also needs to, we, we need to tap into these opportunities uh, as, as, uh, as quickly as they come. We are seeing international organizations taking an interest in also bridging this digital divide. I think APC uh, may talk about um, the support that's coming from organizations like DFID, the UK government, or Swedish CEDA, and, um, and GIZ. I think they've taken a very strong interest in also in technology and how the technology and how the internet can actually be, be spread to, uh, you know, to underdeserved uh, places, especially rural areas using the community network uh, the concept. So let me pause there and maybe my colleagues may have some other ideas to, to add on. Yes, thank you very much again, guys. So um, in the same way, we're meeting Barry as well. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, creating regulation. 
Uh, I'd like to jump to the issue of ESF and subsidizing financing for community networks. Yeah? So I'd like to give that to Josie and also to Joseph uh, to talk about the Kenyan projects where the CA had proposed to actually support community networks. And Joseph, you can also tell us about uh, the proposition by voters to support community networks from the ESF. Yeah? Um, thank you. Yeah, so just to briefly touch on that is that um, this year, I could have said, I think most on time then, since my time. <laughs> but this year, uh, the Communications Authority of Kenya started reviewing the five year strategy for USF. Uh, and it included community networks in the strategy. And it has the aim that over the next five years, they are going to support the build um, of 100 community networks for unserved and underserved communities. That's a really big win. Um, but we're also happy that the support um, would not just be the build, but also we're hoping to see support around capacity building, local content development, which is a more holistic approach to supporting uh, access and digital inclusion rather than just looking at the issue of uh, building on infrastructure. Yes. Um, so, Joseph, over to you. Thank you, uh, Catherine and Josephine. Um, so I, I, will, I will respond according to your question on Portra's stance in, in, in financing uh, community networks uh, locally. So uh, the regulator Portra's through the Universal Sales Fund is this year, uh, welcoming invitations, uh, is inviting people to apply to support establishment of eight community networks across eight provinces. So the idea is to have each province having at least one community network, which is a closer model uh, that is accessible to other district for coping and to be inspired, uh, like creating a set of excellence model in a provincial setting. And uh, the national conference that uh, I earlier spoke about are uh, also platform for national uh, engagement to get more funding locally uh, from private ICT-driven NGOs, uh, from business entities, and also getting good collaboration from the local ISPs. And uh, I can tell you uh, that the, the ISPs are, are very interested in having this complementary model run on, on, on with them uh, to bridge the digital divide. And uh, as Maramida, we have been working very positively with uh, with tier one uh, to get this done. And also Potras um, is in, is introduced the infrastructure sharing model where you do not need to build some towers in certain, certain places or areas, but uh, these commit operators are also available to use uh, that infrastructure which is already built to extend coverage to underserved communities. Uh, thank you so much, back to you. Thank you very much, Joseph. I'd like to move over to you, uh, Jason. Uh, I know you have been in uh, advocacy meetings with MACA. Uh, maybe you can touch on what you'd like to see in terms of eliminating barriers uh, in line with operator licensing, and probably also on infrastructure sharing, which I had my MACA mention in a meeting I was here before Ina, where I did catch it very well. Maybe you can explain it better. All right, thank you so much, Catherine. Yeah, so um, maybe to better respond to your question, let me start by talking about the work that we're just doing with the support of APC and work. So as part of it, we have finished um, a small test research that was being led by the university that was looking at um, that was looking at the you know the environment, the conditions environment for community networks, and it did look at multiple things, including finance. It looked at uh, you know the regulator. The, the, the greater environment, it also looked at um, uh, capacity building you know, as another component, and but also a, another element around um, so capacity building, uh, finance, um, the greater framework, uh, the infrastructure aspects as well, but also access to equipment. Actually, that has been highlighted in the report, and I think we will be using it as a tool to advocate with macro, but also need some information on the same. Uh, but to also mention that. Um, Everything that, um, like what Benigai has spoken, uh, Joseph, but also Josephine, as some of the projects to 
uh, ensuring you know the growth of the metrics. All that is it's happening to Malawi. It's the same even in Malawi. We've got a similar environment. Uh, but coming specifically to uh, Malawi, um, we have had engagements with Macra, but apart from the engagements, what Malawi has done, Macra did at the time not long ago for expression of interest to uh, for community uh, the quality community broadband. Uh, the way it's been described in there, it's a bit different to what a community network is. Uh, it's more like a just level infrastructure, but then it is also sounding more or less like providing opportunities to smaller ISPs to provide, you know, last mile connectivity. While the way we're looking at uh, community networks is something that is bottom up, but also something that is community owned, community driven. So if there could be a way that these two frameworks, I know the community broadband strategy that Macra is talking about is still not yet developed. It is in the process of being developed. And I think this might actually go to the end of the input to say, can we really look at balancing the two, where we're looking at something that is actually driven by the community also coming in as a potential solution to bridging the two divide. Apart from that, we have had conversations with Macra. And one thing that I've already highlighted is um, the USF strategy containing, all right, so this is very good. But the USM strategy containing, um, you know, activities, interventions on setting up community networks, it's there. And they're also saying the only, uh, the only, you know, barrier at the moment for them to implement that is the lack of the framework. So if the regulator can actually quickly work on providing appropriate framework, USF in a way is saying through the strategy, we already have got allocated some resources that can go towards development of community networks. That's what they're saying. But the only barrier is the framework. So it goes back to the policy. We need to submit the policy. And then around infrastructure sharing is another very important aspect. Um, because uh, for, you know, for community networks to be able to set up their own infrastructure, that is impossible. It's going to be very expensive. So to reduce that, we need to provide for a framework that can encourage community you know, infrastructure sharing. And uh, in a way that is affordable for a community, you know, a community with being a startup, but also for them to grow. And then and another bit of all of this is um, Macra also was in the papers recently uh, talking about uh, an MOU with uh, NIF, which is the National Economic Empowerment Fund, with the idea that uh, NIF would be able to finance, you know, these community broadband initiatives. It's a good issue. But as I've mentioned, if we are to balance these two, we need to make sure that we avoid a scenario whereby we are only promoting those that at the end of the day they want to get a profit out of the connection. So if you are sending ISPs to go set up this in the last, last mile connectivity, like last mile connect community communities, the challenge would be that the cost is going to be expensive. So yes, we're providing access you know, to connectivity, but it's not going to be affordable. So still the community must struggle to use it. While the model that we're propagating, the bottom up, is where the communities themselves are able to decide to say, this is the cost. So if we can be able to balance those two things, and I'm happy that uh, Berengai, but also Josephine and Joseph are able to share some of the experiences, you know, from Kenya, experiences from Zimbabwe, where they're still able to use the same message to still be able to provide the required you know, connectivity to all of them. Thank you very much, James. Uh, we only have like a few minutes left. Uh, so I'd like to throw this to uh, to Berengai. Uh, I think in the, at the forefront of creation of policies, uh, one is multi-stakeholdership. And I think the most important also is uh, political goodwill. Uh. If there's no political goodwill, then policies cannot be created. Uh. Um, so maybe you can touch on what approach, what can be done to promote multi-stakeholdership and also what can be done to sensitize government to, to own up the process of digital inclusion instead of leaving it probably to external sources. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Catherine. This time I'm, I'm right. Um, so so um, I, I will not be exhaustive here, but from my experience, the, the first thing that I've uh, that I've realized that uh, that has worked, uh, especially in the context that I've worked in, is firstly just the general awareness. Um, so th th there's one thing that's happening, especially with most of our governments in Africa, that 
they, they are really so much interested to push uh, the, the, the digital economy. And this is a great opportunity to talk about all these options. And um, it is not very surprising that you mention uh, community networks or complementary support, uh, complementary connectivity solutions and governments, whether from the uh, communications ministries or ICT ministries, they may not be very uh, may not be aware of such uh, such solutions, or and and some may not even be aware of even the, the new technologies that are coming up. I think. Uh, uh, some of you may know that uh, there are things like Starlink, for example, or those low orbit satellites that are coming. So, so the awareness is one important aspect which I think we can use and leverage on. And um, I think in almost all of the, our communities and our countries, there are uh, organizations, mostly NGOs, that are pushing for the digital divide uh, or closing the digital divide. And, they, they, they may it may be necessary sometimes to also even form some kind of a consortium so that because I think the, the African um, tradition we believe that uh, just one one voice may not be loud enough but if if you collectively come together and you know push for certain agendas it is most likely that you might uh, get uh, some um, some attention from, from, from the government. Um, and then uh, secondly, I think there's also an opportunity to, uh, to pre-test some of these ideas because you in, know, in, in the African continent, it is very difficult to just talk about a concept without uh, pre-testing it. So it may be necessary sometimes to just start with the, the, uh, the concept itself, the, the, the physical, uh, deployment of a community network. And I think this is actually what happened in countries like Zimbabwe or Namibia, where um, Joseph and his team were very bold enough to just go ahead and pretest a deployment of a community network before there was even any, any framework in, in place. And, but for, for you to be able to do this, you, it means you need to invest a lot in a, uh, in building the necessary, you know, relationships with the, the political, sometimes even the politicians. So I think it is necessary to, to widen the, the scope of connections that we do have so that we, you can influence from different angles. So, so I, I think those two things uh, for me are quite important, especially looking at our African con uh, context that, you know, nothing is, is uh, is, is obvious, you just need to uh, understand the, 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 the context that you're working in and also make use of all the uh, opportunities and the leverage that you can find in that space. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, we have run out of time, but uh, maybe I'd like to give uh, a chance for a question, of, uh, a question or two, if there's any. Uh, maybe from uh, or comment or from our online participants. Uh, we have one. This is this is just a quick question. Um, piggybacking on on what you did earlier, um, but this idea of infrastructure sharing, what does that mean for? Not just infrastructure, power, the right software for the species. What is that what is sharing that infrastructure you need to listen? Thanks for the time. Thank you so much. Yeah, so in a way, my colleagues will be able to come in as well. But what I see in terms of overall infrastructure is for the mini metrics, what is being encouraged most is open source. So we're encouraging mostly open source solutions, uh, you know, building solutions that are open source. Uh, if the infrastructure is providing access to content, then using uh, open source as well. Uh, local chat, then you can do the as local chat, which is also open source. So that is the idea. Uh, that would be able to enhance the uh, enhance the stability aspect of the knowing 
then the cost you know is um, the cost for certain infrastructure is very low. Um, for towers and the others, it's it's very difficult, you know, it's difficult for you to get to configure the tower. So we still need to do with what we can be able to have. But what we're looking for is a cost that is manageable to ensure that the community network itself does not does not actually die in, in cost. Is actually be able to pay us to be able to uh, get one of these. Well, thank you very much, uh, James. Is there any other question? No, maybe just uh, I think my question again goes back to James. Um, to talk about, I think you referred back to how Marka has has done its planning on the community of broadband. I guess he also had the doubts on top of all these in earlier session. However, I come back to the issue of where we're looking for a bottom-up approach, yeah? And for that to happen, I think the community members, the community itself, the bottom, in, for lack of a better word, is supposed to have an idea of what this is. So maybe for you as founder and director of CYD, have you made any initiatives to actually get the community, get the ball early for them to be even aware of of this particular innovation that is happening, because I don't think this is something that's going to come out from 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 the air. From the, I mean, um, and also uh, uh, to just you know, just um, it's very interesting to know the seniors um, seniors pockets in community networks. Um, you talked about how most of them started in 2016, but uh, regulations for them to get regulated is came out earlier. Is it just an idea of lack of knowledge or is it negligence? I would just like to just be aware of that in case you might also throw something. Uh, I think our panelists like participants to respond uh, because of the sort of like what is up. There is there not to answer. I just had to end the the question we posed. So I just come from another question where we were talking about digital e-literacy, right? So you mentioned community networks as a question. With that in mind, is there a bottom up, top down structure that makes the people um, in a relationship and so what structures are in place to keep in mind that the truth may be that there are folks that most of the community is involved in the structure or if there is any thought to such structures. So I, uh, my question is this. The community is about to survive sort of how to approach. So now I, I'm asking this question just to know how would you engage the community that has like zero idea of what community network is and what community network can do for them? And let's say you are just one person in the community that really understands the potential of community network, but then you have a lot of people around you that don't even know. Anything about community network? What strategies would you use to like make these people understand how community network can be beneficial? That, that, that's one. And then the second one is is this: uh, what do you think about uh, having community have like many uh, applications and solutions that are not that are quite different from the mainstream? Maybe messaging applications that you have that requires you to have internet access before you can use them. So, do you think it's a great idea for communities to have their local messaging app, for example, that works offline where they don't have to connect to the internet before they can use it? And also, do you think it is also a great idea? Or what do you think about the possibility of the community having like a kind of infrastructure that allows communities to have like different files? Example, okay, if we are in a community, for example, it's possible that you see people, like so many people downloading the same files at the same time or at different times, 
But what, what, what do you think about having a solution whereby two or more people, or more people do not that with a particular file from the internet, maybe they can, do you think there's a possibility of having like a position where we can have like a file, maybe, I think I know I have a file in the community, you can just have it, just post it somewhere in the community that anybody can have access to. Okay, I read down there this game, this game you want it, you can just go up like this space. You think, Yes. So, all that is possible in community. So to start answering the first question, um, I think it is, I think all of you have asked sort of like the same question. Yeah, so where we are working on is we need to raise awareness about community metrics as a potential solution. And be mindful that I've talked about us as an organization being in over 150 schools. So this is over 150 school communities. And these particular school communities already have got some access to educational quality within the school environment that can also be accessed by community members. But beyond that, it means that is the demand. So we don't have the metric that we're able to use to raise awareness about such a potential solution. That from there, we're able to demand to save metrics. And we know that what we're looking for now is beyond having access to local content, we are interested to look at how this can be connected to the rest of the world. So more or less like an add on what we're already doing. Um, what you have indicated, the last question you are talking about, are there a bit of local apps? That's the advantage of having community networks. It's not uh, like everything is going to come from, uh, from, from the world, like from the internet. You can actually have some of these files being shared you know, locally. Uh, people can be able to create their own content and then put it there, have access to it in their own communities. There is a potential as well of Rocket Church uh, as an app where people in the basic communities are able to chat, you know, they don't even have, to have access to internet, but they're able to chat within the same community. Unless they would want to reach out to somebody who is outside this particular community, then they're able to do that. So I think within community networks, the opportunities are limited. Just quickly, I think that your question around why it took so long uh, and to earn certain instructions uh -huh, is that it's, it's uh, awareness raising is both bottom up and top down and solutions are both bottom up and top down so with the networks now um there is where we build uh, support or capacity for the communities to manage the network and everything but also we are actively now involved in terms of building that uh, top down capacity where for ABC, for example, we, um, and under the Lockmate Initiative, we are working with um, ITU um, and other partners to be able to see if we can be able to come up with courses for regulators to be able to understand more on community networks. So there are different partners and stakeholders also that come into this. I think uh, some years back, we did um, a Lockmate uh, did capacity building for different regulators. Uh, IACO, ATRA, um, to do capacity for community uh, for them to be able to create um, uh, regulation for community network. So there's awareness building across board because I think how the telecommunications uh, industry was envisioned is that it would be always commercially driven and not uh, for social purposes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for participating. I hope this has been a valuable session for all of you. So in case you're interested in learning more community networks and the work that's been done around it, uh, you can go to www.abc.org. You can also go to www.ktalent.org.a. Lots and lots of resources you can find there. So thank you very much for being part of this session. And if you'd like to engage our panelists, just take it again. Oh, okay.